The steel type is one of my favorites in all of Pokemon. You can take just about anything, slap some metal on it, and it instantly becomes cooler. So I wanted to try a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sword with only steel types. In this run, my rival's gonna have a fire type starter, there's a treacherous early game fire type gym, and the champion's ace is a fire type, so I've definitely got my work cut out for me. Before I start, let me know in the comments who your favorite steel type is and why. As always, the rules of the challenge will be in the description, so feel free to check them out if you're not familiar. As much as I would love to have a metal Grookey, unfortunately, there's no steel type starter to choose from in the Galar region, so I'll have to get a little more creative to get my starter Pokemon. By heading over to the Isle of Armor, I can meet the Diglett guy. He's lost all of his Diglett and needs help getting them back. This is so sad. One like and one subscribe equals one Diglett returned home. Be responsible. Do your part. He rewards me for grabbing Diglett by the hair and yanking them out of the ground like carrots. After finding 30 of them, he gives me an Alolan Sandshrew. It's an Ice and Steel type Pokemon which is really cool and it's going to serve as my starter Pokemon for this run. Under my challenge rule set, I can get one Wild Area or Isle of Armor encounter now, as well as one extra encounter for each gym badge that I obtain. I'm also playing by the rule of no Raid Den encounters to prevent me from getting a super strong Lucario straight away. With this in mind, my first encounter is a set of house keys. I give Klefki the nickname Tool, and it's an awesome Pokemon. It gets access to some great support moves, which combos really nicely with its prankster ability. It doesn't evolve, but its stats are really good for the early game too. My team at the moment is pretty weak, so I'm going to need quite a bit of preparation. First, I spam the Digging Duo until I can get an Ice Stone. I can use this to then evolve Sandshrew into a Sand Slash. I then shake a bunch of berry trees, particularly targeting Ochre, Chopple, and Citrus Berries, as these are going to be really useful. With that taken care of, I can now head to Motorstoke for some very important business like upgrading my style and printing a trainer card. While I'm here, I also buy the TMs for Light Screen and Reflect. I decided to teach these to Klefki and give it a light clay that was dug up earlier to extend the duration of my screens. Next up is the first real battle with Hop. His team is super physical, so I go with Klefki and set up a Reflect. I then switch into Sand Slash and Wulu decides to start lowering my attack with Growl, but a Swords Dance can nullify this. After using Defense Curl, the power of Rollout is doubled, taking Wulu out in two turns. Fortunately, I land my attacks and sweep the rest of Hop's team with Rollout. That could have been dicey. Heading on to Route 3, and I'm able to catch a Clink here. Since it's a Steel Gear, I give it the very fitting nickname of Rage Against the Machine. This trainer gave me a really rough time, as his Sizzlipede is super threatening. I had to rely on an Ockerberry and landing my rollout, but took it down. In the Galar Mine, I'm able to catch a Drillbur, but I can't use it until it evolves into an Excadrill, as it won't gain a Steel Typing until then. Bead then challenges me to a battle, but his Psychic types aren't too much of a threat, as they don't really deal that well with Steel Pokemon. His team generally has really low physical defense, so I'm able to sweep through them with Icicle Spear on Sand Slash. After exiting the cave, I make it out onto Route 4, where I can catch Ramstein the Galarian Meowth. Afterwards, I'd finally made it to Turfield for my very first gym challenge. Wulubots, roll out! My plan for Milo is really simple. I lead with Klefki and set up Light Screen and Reflect before switching into Sand Slash. The screens that I've set up, as well as my typing, means that Milo can barely touch me allowing me to easily max my attack with Swords Dance. With this setup, a few Icicle Spears gives me a very easy win. My next stop is Route 5, where a Zigzagoon licks my keys? Gross, not cool, dude. I then have a rematch with Hop. My plan is to set up Reflect with Klefki and use Sand Slash's rollout to sweep. But Wulu crits on a 4 times effective double kick, which really hurts. It only goes for Tackle afterwards though, which does much less damage, and I'm able to land 2 rollouts for the KO. Raboot will outspeed my Sand Slash, but Reflect and Ockerberry should help me live a Flame Charge. But it went for Round anyway, and fell to Rollout, as does Corvusquire a short time later. I can now breathe a huge sigh of relief because that fight was stressful. I hate having to rely on Rollout not missing, but it's my best option at the moment for dealing with Fire types. After exiting Route 5, I make it to Holbury where Oleana is on patrol. I'm now clear to take on the next gym, but where did all of these people come from? There's like 10 houses in this town. Nessa can be really tough, as her water types resist my steel. I do have a plan though, and it revolves around Clink. I go with my standard opening of using Klefki to set up both Light Screen and Reflect. This helps Clink survive while I increase its defenses with Charge and Iron Defense. The combination of Leftovers and Protect also helps to keep me healthy while I set up. Once my defenses are maxed, 
I'm able to knock out Goldeen with a Thunderbolt. Aracuda is pretty frail, so it too goes down with two Thunderbolts. Last is Dreadnor, and my goal is to stall out the Dynamax. I've been sure to manage my Protect PP throughout this fight, and it's this, combined with my defense increases, that helps me stall out the Dynamax. I've taken a lot of damage, but I have enough bulk to land two Thunderbolts, finishing the fight, and earning my second badge. To celebrate, Rose treats me to a really nice dinner, but look at the size of those earrings. You know what they say about big hoops. Into the second Galar Mine, where Bede wants a rematch. I can handle this fight by sending out Meowth, and using Hone Claws to boost my attack. Thanks to Bede's Pokemon having a low physical defense, Meowth can very easily sweep through his team with Metal Claw. I then encounter a Stunfisk. It gives me a really hard time as it just won't get in the ball. I consider running as it starts to get really dangerous, but just in time, I managed to catch it. Next was a battle with Team Yell, and I had a really close call with a Pancham who nearly knocked out my Meowth with Low Sweep. A switch into Klefki helped me finish the fight safely, but that was way too close. In the Motorstoke outskirts, I'm able to catch a Pawniard, which is basically just a walking knife rack. I give it the nickname Slayer, but its timid nature is really not ideal. This brings me back to Motorstoke for a battle with Marnie. Klefki's Fairy type gives it a really good matchup against Marnie's Dark types. First, I use Reflect to reduce my physical damage, and then combo this with Draining Kiss, which does really big damage while also recovering HP. It's a pretty easy sweep, but I did come really close to overleveling here, so I'll have to box Klefki right up until I battle Kabu. It's now time to take on the Motorstoke Gym, but even the Gym Challenge is dangerous, as I've got to take on Fire types, and sometimes it's a two-on-one. I managed to get around this by teaching Sand Slash Earthquake and giving it Ocker Berries. This reduces the risk, and I can make it to Kabu without too much trouble. I spend ages preparing a strategy and upgrading my movesets for this fight. I have a plan, but there will definitely be blood spilt. I lead with Stunfisk, and my main goal is to set up Stealth Rock. This will land big damage on Kabu's next two Pokemon as they're sent out. Ninetales isn't dealing too much damage, so while it's not required for the plan, I use this extra time to land a Metal Sound and Thunder Wave. Sadly, I do have to sacrifice Stunfisk in the process, but he did his job well. I send out Klefki next, and take advantage of Ninetales' lowered special defense to knock it out with two Draining Kisses while restoring my HP. Arcanine is sent out next, and my first priority is paralyzing it with Thunder Wave to lower its speed. After this, I then set up Reflect, as Kabu's last two Pokemon are both physical attackers. Unfortunately, Arcanine does use Agility, which mitigates lowering its speed and really hurts my plan. I slowly chip away with Draining Kiss, and just before Klefki falls, I switch into Meowth, who is unfortunately sacrificed in the process. However, this does give me a safe switch into Sand Slash, and I go for Rollout. Arcanine was fully paralyzed, but I did have an Ockerberry anyway. With Rollout connecting, Arcanine falls. Last is Center Scorch, and it loses half of its health straight away to Stealth Rock thanks to its 4 times Rock weakness. Sand Slash outspeeds, and thankfully lands a second consecutive rollout to finish Center Scorch and give me the third badge. That fight was treacherous, and we lost some really good Pokemon there, but I'm just glad to have made it through because I spent way too long planning that. A short peruse through the wild area brings me to Hammerlock, where I can buy a Raindance TM. Gee, this would have been really useful like 5 minutes ago. Sonya shows me Galar's most sacred treasure, the subscribe button. Don't you just want to press it? Hmm? My team is looking a little worse for wear, so I'm going to need to find some reinforcements. But with three new badges, I can head into the wild area to grab three new steel soldiers. First up is Hone Edge, who has a really cool ghost typing which will help me deal with fighting types. Next is Riolu, who as you probably know becomes an absolute monster once it evolves. Finally, I head over to the Isle of Armor, where I'm able to catch Skarmory. It's a defensive tank with an immunity to ground types which really complements my team. Thanks to the higher level cap, I can also evolve Drillbur into an Excadrill, which is now usable thanks to being a Steel type. After raising Riolu's friendship, it evolves into a Lucario. This guy is a powerhouse, and it can be either a physical or special attacker. I'm probably going to lean towards special for most of this run, as Steel type already has some pretty good physical attackers. While westbound on Route 6, I'm able to find my next encounter, Durant. The rest of this route is pretty clean, bringing me to Stolen Side for a rematch with Hop. I introduce him to my Lucario, who rips Hop apart. It is an absolute slaughter. With that taken care of, I can now challenge the Stolen Side Jim, whose leader uses fighting type Pokemon. While fighting is a weakness of steel, I do have a strategy and it is really cheesy. After adding Hone Edge to the team, I evolve it at level 35, and then use a Duskstone which I got from the Digging Duo to evolve it once more into an Aegislash. 
This guy is the only Pokemon that I intend on using for the next gym. B's lead is a Hitmontop who knows only normal and fighting type attacks. Aegislash's Ghost type means that it can't be hit by anything that Hitmontop can throw out. This means that I'm completely free to max my attack with Swords Dance and my speed with Automize. From here, it is a very easy Iron Head sweep. That was way too exploitable. After the battle, Bead challenges me to a rematch, but my team is just way too powerful for him at this point, and I quickly sweep him with Iron Head. After quickly moving through the Glimwood Tangle, I've made it to Bolognia for another gym battle. As the first gym trainer reminds us, Steel is a weakness of Fairy type, so this should be a pretty manageable gym. Opal's lead is a Weezing, and it is pure garbage. I can easily boost my attack with Hone Claws, and take Weezing down with Iron Head. More Wile is sent out next, and it lowers my attack with Intimidate, but an Earthquake quickly takes care of it. Togekiss is sent out next, and I first go for a Hone Claws, as I'll need to be at plus 2 attack. After this, one Iron Head takes it down. Last is Dynamax Alcremie, but with my attack at this level, it's guaranteed to go down in one Iron Head, giving me the win and badge number 5. That was embarrassing, Opal. How can you be a gym leader for 300 years and still get smacked around like that? Now on to Route 7, where Hop wants a rematch, and while Cinderace is the only threat on his team, it's a really big threat. With Klefki, I set up Reflect, and I've given Excadrill an Ockerberry to help it tank a Pyro Ball. But the AI went for agility anyway, so it didn't matter in the end, and Cinderace fell. The rest of the battle was otherwise clean, giving me another win. While still on Route 7, I was able to catch a Corviknight, who is kind of like the Wish.com version of Skarmory. Clink also evolved into Clang, and I ran into a Berserker, and it just reminds me of what could have been. There isn't too much for me on Route 8, but I am able to catch a Bronzong here, before quickly moving through to Sir Chester City. After navigating through the Harsh Sandstorm, it's time to take on Gordy, who can't be taken lightly. While Steel types do have the advantage against Rock types, his Barbarical and Colossal can be deadly. I decided to lead with Clang, and Barbarical uses Shell Smash. Thanks to the defense drop from this, one Thunderbolt is able to knock it out. Next is Shuckle, who can be annoying, but it's not really a huge threat. After lowering its defense with Screech, I switch into Excadrill and slowly chip away with Iron Head until it finally falls. I need to make sure that Excadrill can outspeed Colossal, and my speed was lowered by Rock Tomb, so I decide to switch into Klefki and set up Reflect, and land a Thunder Wave onto Stonjona. By bringing Excadrill back out, I reset the speed drops and raise my attack to plus 2 with Swords Dance, and then take Stonjona down with Earthquake. Last is Colossal, and it's a really hard hitter, and can also do huge damage with Heat Crash. However, I'm faster, and thanks to my attack buffs, I'm able to take it down in one shot with Earthquake, finishing the fight, and giving me badge number 6. After the battle, Sonya discovers a new parchment from the old Galar legend. My god, what secrets are hidden in this sacred text? Hop wants another rematch, but this is really similar to my fight with B. His double lead has no moves that can hit Aegislash, leaving me free to max my attack and speed before sweeping him very quickly with Sacred Sword. A short surf across Route 9 brings me to Spikemuth. Marnie refuses to let me see the shed that she was raised in and demands a battle. Her Lipard lead is really frail, and one Aura Sphere from Lucario takes it down with ease. Scrafty is a little more threatening, so I switch into Klefki, as its Fairy type gives it a much better matchup. Draining Kiss hits it hard, while restoring my health, allowing me to take Scrafty down. More Peko is next, but it's a really similar story, and Klefki handles it. Toxicroak can't really hit my Steel types, so an eventual switch into Excadrill lets me take it down with a single Earthquake. That gives me the win, and I can now access Spikemuth to take on the next gym. The lead appears he's holding a concert, and my heavy metal team is about to open up the pit. I go with Lucario, and raise my special attack to plus 2 with Nasty Plot. Scrafty does no Brick Break, but a Tropple Berry helps mitigate the damage from this, and Aura Sphere takes it down on the next turn. Obstagoon is next, and I expect it to use either Obstruct or Counter. I get greedy, and try another Nasty Plot. It ended up going for Shadow Claw, but I lived it comfortably, and can KO it on the next turn with Aura Sphere. Next is Malamar, but it too goes down in one shot. Skuntank nearly knocks me out with Sucker Punch, but Lucario just hangs on and finishes it with Aura Sphere. That fight was a little dicey, but clean in the end. There's a disaster going on outside, but let's all congregate in an enclosed tunnel, that's not dangerous at all. Leon saves the day, standing next to a Pokemon carcass like he caught it on a fishing trip. With that taken care of, I can now head back to Hammerlock for the final gym challenge. This guy Raihan has got to have the laziest gym challenge ever. He's just assembled three trainers in a room. 
At least Piers had clowns and circus tricks. Raihan's team is highly physical, so I lead with Klefki and instantly use Reflect to protect me from physical damage. My other lead is a Sandslash, who I've given a Choice Scarf so that it can outspeed Flygon, and instantly finish it with an Icicle Spear. With Flygon down, I then switch Klefki into Excadrill, as I want to lay down some Choice Band boosted Earthquakes for big damage. With Sandslash, I try to knock out Sandaconda with Icicle Spear, but don't land enough, allowing it to paralyze my Excadrill with Glare. Gigalith also does some huge damage with Body Press onto Sandslash, but thanks to Reflect, I'm just able to survive. As Earthquake will damage everyone on the field, I switch Sandslash out into Skarmory, who won't be hit by the friendly fire due to its flying type. As an added bonus, Sandaconda also tried to use Earth Power on that slot, so Skarmory was also immune to that too. With one big Earthquake, Excadrill picks up a double KO. Last is Dynamax Duraludon, and it's really tough, but it is a 2 on 1. Before going into the fight, my plan was to land two Earthquakes with Excadrill, but I'm slower than Duraludon due to Paralysis. I don't want to risk losing Excadrill here, so I land only one Earthquake before switching into Klefki, who survives a Max Knuckle due to Reflect, and its Fairy Typing. A Metal Sound from Skarmory lowers Duraludon's special defense, and on the next turn, Klefki is able to take it down with a Draining Kiss. The Paralysis on Excadrill made that battle really tough, but I managed to make it through and event the final badge. With all 8 badges secured, I'm now northbound on Route 10, where I can catch a Duraludon. It's a Dragon and Steel type, which is just about as cool of a combination as you can possibly get. Of course, while here, I have to stop by and remind Cabby Jeffrey who the boss is. Stop! Stop! He's already dead! Before making it to Winden for the final of the Champions Cup. First up is Marnie, and my plan here is pretty simple. I use Swords Dance with Excadrill on turn 1, as Lipard goes for a nasty plot. With this boost, I'm then able to take it down on the next turn, as well as the Scrafty that follows. Toxicroak is up next, and since I'm immune to poison, it can only hit me with either Sucker Punch or Swagger. I use this to my advantage and boost my attack with Swords Dance while draining its Sucker Punch PP. I do have a Person Berry equipped just in case it goes for Swagger, but it never did and I can take it down with an Earthquake. With my attack maxed, the rest of Marnie's team gives me no trouble at all and it's a pretty clean fight. Our last battle with Hop was completely free, but unfortunately, he hasn't really learnt his lesson yet. He still leads with Dub Wool, although he has taught it Zen Headbutt now, it barely does any damage. I'm still free to max my attack and speed, while Leftover's recovery can heal off the little damage that Dub Wool can do. Once again, this setup leaves me free to completely sweep his team. You were a good early game rival Hop, but get rid of that sheep. It's now time to take care of everyone's favourite villains, Macro Cosmos. This involves quite a few double battles with Hop, and it's really satisfying as I get to knock out his double over and over again with Earthquake, like lambs to the slaughter. This brings me to Oleana for another tricky battle, but my plan is quite simple. I lead with Excadrill, and quickly remove Frostlass with an Iron Head. This baits her into sending out Milotic next, which is exactly what I wanted. I then switch into Klefki, and paralyze it, as well as setting up Light Screen. I can then switch into Aegislash, and raise my speed, and attack. From here, a Sacred Sword is enough to take care of Milotic, Salazzle, and Serena. Last is Garbodor, but unfortunately, I couldn't take it out in one shot, and Aegislash sadly falls to a Max Quake. Skarmory's bulk lets me stall out the Dynamax, and I can then finish the fight with a Drill Peck. With a new slot opened up for the next few fights, I decided to add Pornyard to the team, who I evolved into a Bishop. Bead's back for another beatdown, and I don't expect this fight to be any more challenging than our previous ones. I lead with Klefki to eat the Intimidate, as well as set up Reflect and a Thunder Wave. A quick switch into Excadrill left me max my attack with Swords Dance, before rapidly sweeping through the rest of Bead's team like a knife through butter. The next fight needs a little more prep work though. First, I head over to the Isle of Armor, where I can catch a Magnemite. I quickly evolved into a Magneton, and then a Magnezone. I also add Clang to the team, and evolve it into Clin Clang. Really Game Freak, is that the best name that you can do? Next up is a fight with Nessa, and this fight is really challenging, but the new additions to my team should help give me some electric coverage. I lead with Kling Clang, and a quick Thunderbolt forces Goliathopod out thanks to its emergency exit ability. Nessa sends out Barrascooter next, and I tank a drill run before electrocuting that fish with Thunderbolt. Goliathopod then returns, but another Thunderbolt finishes the job that I started earlier. Again seeking, I switch into Magnazone, who takes it down with a Thunderbolt of its own, as well as the Pelipper that follows. Last is Dreadnought, but my Magnazone is tanky enough to barely live a G-Max move, before finishing it off with a second Thunderbolt on the very next turn. The next gym leader that I'll be rematching against is B. 
I really wish that I still had Aegislash, as it would trivialize this whole fight, but instead I'll need to think of another plan. Since her whole team are physical attackers, I use Reflect and Iron Dance with Klefki to easily withstand her attacks. From here, I can simply spam Draining Kiss to deal damage while recovering HP. This is really effective, allowing me to take care of Howlucha, Phalanx, Grappelocked, and Surfetched. Last is Machamp, and this is where the problem arises, as I've actually run out of Draining Kiss PP. I can't attack, but with my huge defensive setup, I can easily tank 3 max flares from Machamp, stalling out the Dynamax. With that now over, it's time to launch the counterattack. I switch into Skarmory, and my huge defenses buy me enough time to take Machamp down with two Drill Pecks. B was definitely harder without Aegislash, but in the end, the result was the exact same. I've made it to the final of the Champions Cup against Raihan and his deadly dragons. He leads with everyone's favorite dragon, Torkoal. It sets up the sun, but I can't let it fire off any sun-boosted lava plumes as it'll rip my Steel-type Pokemon apart. To counter this, my plan is to lead with Klefki and use Rain Dance to override the weather. I set up Reflect before switching into Duraludon. My Choice Scarf lets me outspeed and chip away at Raihan's Pokemon with Dragon Pulse, which eventually removes his first four Pokemon. His very last Pokemon is a Duraludon of its own, and it's just out of range of a two-hit KO. I can easily tank a Max Knuckle, but as Reflect wears off and it gets an attack boost, I'm not so confident about living another. I decide to switch into Skarmory, whose Natural Bulk, plus Protect, lets me stall out the last two Dynamax turns. I just live a Stone Edge and then manage to land a Metal Sound, which lowers Duraludon's special defense. My best bet is a switch into Lucario, and I thought I would outspeed, but Raihan's Duraludon has a plus speed nature, allowing it to land a Body Press, which almost KO'd Lucario. I just survive and land an Aura Sphere for the KO, but that was way too close, I nearly lost Lucario there. Rose is trying to carry out some evil deeds, and I know just the thing to stop him, a rusted children's toy. It's a Steel-type showdown, and my plan is incredibly cheesy and it revolves around Skarmory. Rose's whole team are physical Steel-types, and so Skarmory's huge defense, combined with three Iron Defenses, makes me untouchable. Leftovers helps to keep me healthy, and I can use this time to max my attack with Swords Dance. The rest of the fight is just a Drill Peck spam fest. Even G-Max Copperaja can barely touch me as I sweep Rose's team. The tactics are dirty, but it gets the job done. To save the day, I'll need to stop Eternatus, but this fight horrifies me as the AI is just so random, you never know what it's going to do. I decided to go with Assault Vest Duraludon, but it was quickly weakened. I decided to switch into Klefki, as only one of Eternatus' moves can hit me, but of course, that's the one it chose, and it did big damage with a flamethrower. Since the AI is random, I was under the impression that I had a 3 in 4 chance to live, and so decided to stay in and set up a light screen, but of course, Eternatus used another flamethrower, KOing Klefki. As evidence of how random the AI is, on the very next turn, it tried to use Cross Poison against Lucario. I must have been so unlucky for it to use Flamethrower twice against Klefki. Anyway, the AI has now had a change of mind, and this lets me land two Dragon Pulses to quickly take it down. But the fun doesn't stop there, as I'll now need to take Eternatus on in a raid battle. My plan is simply to stall while the rest of the party does the heavy lifting. First, I switch into Skarmory, as its sturdy ability and Protect will help me stall. I get hit on the first turn, but survive it comfortably. Of course, of all the moves it could use, and targets that Eternatus could select, it used Max Flare again on my Skarmory, taking it down. I send out Lucario next, as it's holding a Focus Sash, but what a surprise, Eternatus hits me again, breaking the Sash. Eternatus falls on the next turn, but that was one of the unlucky encounters I've ever had with it. It feels so unpredictable, screw you Eternatus. This brings me to the grand finale of the challenge, against Leon and his powerful and diverse team. I've lost most of my setup mons going into this fight, and I'm underleveled, so this is going to be really challenging. I lead with Bronzong, and its primary goal is to set up Stealth Rock. Aegislash uses a King Shield on turn 1, giving me enough time to also set up a Reflect. Bronzong has done its job, but sadly, it falls on the next turn. Now the counterattack can begin. I send in Choice Scarf Excadrill, and quickly remove Aegislash with an Earthquake. Haxorus is next, and while it does land a super effective Earthquake, the damage is minimal thanks to my Reflect. I outspeed, and after Leon heals, it's a two-hit KO with Earthquake. Excadrill can do big damage to Rhyperia with an Earthquake, but sadly, a Heat Crash finally takes down my excellent Excadrill. As Rhyperia has low special defense, I send in Duraludon next, and can finish it off with a Dragon Pulse. This brings Rillaboom to the field, and while it does no high horsepower, it can't actually use it yet since I'm holding an Air Balloon. 
It goes for knockoff first, but I take it down with a second Dragon Pulse before it can even use high horsepower. Next, Leon goes into Dragapult. It's super fast and hits hard, knocking Duraludon out with one Shadow Ball. Dragapult's a huge threat, but I do have a plan to take it down, involving Sand Slash. I'm holding a Focus Sash, which guarantees that I'll be able to land one attack. I use this turn to set up Hail. This change in the weather activates my Slush Rush ability, meaning that I'm now just faster than Dragapult. With my newfound speed, I can use Icicle Spear to finish Dragapult in one turn. This brings out Leon's ace, Charizard. It instantly loses half of its health though due to Stealth Rock damage. I'm faster due to the hail and land a 4 times effective Rock Slide to finish Charizard off before it even has a chance to move. And there it is, a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sword with only Steel types. If you want more hardcore Nuzlocke challenges, make sure to click this playlist to check out more of my runs just like this one. Let me know in the comments who your MVP was, and subscribe to the channel. It's completely free, but it really helps me out. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.